live on our q and a webcast uh, with the cleveland orchestra flute section my name is kristen moore i'm the u.s direct sales manager here at powell flutes so thrilled to have this wonderful group of musicians here with me today um, I can't wait for everybody to hear their wisdom and um, please feel free to ask questions along the way via the comment section. Um, but I'll introduce everybody and then maybe we'll, uh, you know, kind of wait a couple minutes as we wait for guests and audience members to sign on. But uh, I'm joined today by Joshua Smith, Principal Flutist of the Cleveland Orchestra, Jessica Sindel, Assistant Principal Flutist, Saren St. Christopher, second flutist, and Mary Kay Fink, piccoloist. All our uh, members of the Cleveland Orchestra, we're so thrilled to have them. Thanks for uh, coming on today, everybody. Pleasure, thank you. <laughs> so we'll, um, you know, like I said, kind of give our uh, guests signing on to Facebook a couple minutes to sign on and get comfortable, maybe uh, grab an afternoon tea or iced coffee to get us through that two o'clock Eastern hump. There we go. <laughs> Jess is all ready. Hi. Um, and if you um, see any furry friends pop up in our screens today, <laughs> I know we have uh, not just the flute section, but some, uh, some friends as well. <laughs> um, and Mary Kay, who are you joined by? Uh, this is actually my mother's cat, Callie. My oh. mother moved in with us recently and uh, this is her cat Callie so now we have three cats and a dog so it's pretty <laughs> interesting around here that is a full house oh my gosh Sarah and your puppy yes this is uh, my new puppy winter <laughs> oh <laughs> and new how old is winter five and a half months oh my gosh <laughs> and just I saw a little bit of Sophie your pup yes I can't camera shy right now that's <laughs> Uh, it's the important things, you know, we have to have a little bit of lightness and, and, and happiness through our animals. So thank you so much again. If you're just tuning in, my name is Kristen Moore. I'm the U.S. Direct Sales Specialist for Powell Flutes. I have with me the members of the Cleveland Orchestra Flute Section, Joshua Smith, Jessica Sindel, Saren St. Christopher, and Mary Kay Fink. Um, so I, you know, I think it's always kind of a, a nice first question um, as we are in this bizarre time, uh, overused bizarre. Um, what have you all been up to in the past several months, you know, in the spring, over the summer? Um, and I'll, you know, you guys can decide who wants to talk first, jump right in, please feel free. <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> so um, I just mentioned that my mother moved in. Um, my mother, fell in January at the age of 96 and had two hip surgeries. And um, she was kicked out of rehab in April, really not able to take care of herself. And so luckily I was not employed. And so I've been spending a whole lot of time in Milwaukee, um, helping her recover and um, being there because she couldn't be by herself. And um, then we made the decision that she couldn't live on her own anymore. So she has moved here to Cleveland. So then there was a lot of getting her, you know, apartment cleaned out and all that that entails. And now we're still kind of in the unpacking here phase. Um, but she's visited here a lot in the past. So it's not completely foreign. And um, so far things are going well. Um, so so yeah, that's, I actually, the timing was kind of serendipitous for us. I don't know what we would have done as a family if I had been working full time. So. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, such a, maybe a little overused phrase, but blessing in disguise. And, you know, we have to find those moments to, you know, help us get through this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How is, um, has, has, have you guys all been, you know, do you find yourselves really inspired to keep practicing and playing a lot or has it been like a really welcome break to just kind of step back from your instruments and, you know, take a little breather and reconnect in other ways? I'll, I'll dive into that one. I know, I, I, and I know from having talked to the other people that, that were in similar boats, I, um, I was, surprised to learn about myself um, that I that I practice 
And I, I love to practice actually. I mean, I love the, the practicing for me, rehearsing the, the process for me is, is so much more interesting. Maybe, I mean, I, I guess I can't really compare. Performing is wonderful. You know, communicating to an audience is a great thing. But for me, what I really love about what I do is the process of building it and exploring and experimenting and all of that. So I've always loved that. But what I learned about myself recently is that I do that willingly and easily because I have deadlines to fill. And when I don't, I just, I, I'm, I'm not that interested in that like that part of the creative aspect for myself. So I'm, you know, I, I spent a good month or so, like I think many, many people in the world did, um, you, just feeling lost and trying to figure out what to do. And, um, and I'm, I'm like still learning, you know, about how to do, I'm like, I have a, I live in a big old house. I'm um, figuring out how to take care of many aspects of it kind of by myself. And, um, you know, like the, the kinds of things like um, at the point when the sink broke, I couldn't call a plumber, like the plumbers weren't coming to houses. And so I had to figure out how to do that by myself. And so I've, I've done um, that kind of thing. Like, um, I, and I actually have enjoyed learning how to do a lot of things that I had never ever even thought of doing before. Um, and, and, but I, when I, when I was feeling most lost, I decided to, that, that if I did nothing else for the, however long it's going to be, I, I wanted to learn how to meditate and what that meant and what it meant to me. And so, um, it's been helpful. That's, that's what's been getting me through is, is just kind of like an introspection and, um, a, a revamping of how to live in the present. Yeah, absolutely. Meditation, you know, it's such a good skill to have, especially as musicians. And, you know, it'll be so interesting then how you can take that new skill and, you know, bring it when life goes back to normal, you know, as like a sense of grounding. And Sure. Wow. Yeah. And you may have noticed from some of the answers to the questions that I, I have that in my, like, I've always had a sort of a, an awareness of, of needing to live in the present and, but, but it's actually really hard to, to, you know, kind of remember that all the, all of the time. We all know that, but yeah. the, the, I, I have appreciated having the time and the, the energy and the desire to, um, to dive into that sort of aspect of like, if you call it spirituality, um, just, just really focusing on how to stay here. Oh, that's a really lovely thought. And it's, you know, you came out like with some positives through all of this craziness. <laughs> Trying to, yeah. Yeah. Saren and Jess, have you guys felt, you know, motivated to practice or just, you know, stepping away, enjoying that time? I'm oh, sorry, Jess. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I practiced on and off. I go through cycles where I practice every day and I enjoy, um, just playing through the stuff on my shelf that I haven't looked at since I was in college or doing old exercises or running through concertos and then stopping completely and just working on house projects or, you know, I have a new puppy, which is <laughs> demands a lot of time and attention. Um, I'm going to, my next project is to paint my kitchen cabinets. So I've been researching how to use shellac primer and how to prep and you know, how I'm gonna do this because it's very um, uh, overwhelming and it takes skill. Like I paint everything. I painted my, you can probably see my, I have like a purple ceiling back there and I painted everything in my house but I've never done anything that required that level of prep. So I'm, I'm, that's what I'm tackling next. Beautiful. How about you, Jess? I, yeah, I was just gonna say it's, for me, it's been coming in waves. I, I agree with Josh. I I practice if I have some sort of a motivation behind it, you know, whether it's a concert or uh, a audition. I mean, well, that's not happening. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Well, you have something to tell us, Jess? <laughs> I know. I, oh my God, please. <laughs> But um, what's really been um, helping me is uh, teaching. I, um, you know, I've been teaching alongside with Mary Kay at CIM right now, uh, studio classes. That's been a new world for me. I, I haven't had um, the chance to come up with 
different topics to teach mm -hmm. college students. And, you know, I mean, the other day uh, we covered a class on syrinx and, and I went back into some of the archives in the NFA um, and discovered new historical backgrounds that I had never heard before um, regarding the piece. And, you know, uh, it, it was, it was really rewarding for me to be able to share that with the studio and you know it, it kept me interested so i'm i feel like i'm creating helping to create different classes to also inspire myself a lot yeah, absolutely and we have that time to spend researching and digging even deeper past what we already know it's yeah it's a good way to like come out of this with something new absolutely yeah mm -hmm. Um, so thank you, you know, if you are just tuning in um, for our live Q&A webcast with the flute section of the Cleveland Orchestra. Um, and as always, please feel free to leave your comments, tell us hello. Um, you can send questions via the comment section. Um, and hello, uh, Pam Muncy from Muncy Winch. She said that um, she learned that she's a procrastinator with this extra time. So I think we can all relate to that. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I think as, um, you know, we are kind of looking back over the, the last couple of months, if we could even look back a little bit further and for maybe those of us, those of the people in our audience who aren't as familiar with the four of you, would you mind um, just sharing how long you've been with the orchestra in your positions? Uh, if I had finished this season, it would have been my 30th. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> How about you, Mary Kay? Um, same. Well, I guess I started in mid-season, uh, but it's approximately the same. I started January of the same year Josh joined in September. So well, I think, I, think I joined in September, so you may have like one year ahead of me in a sense. Almost a year. It's, yeah. It was eight months because I started in January, which was odd. But, um, but I get credit for that whole season. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Saren? I, I think it would have been 14 this season. Wow. And Jess as the, the newbie of the section. <laughs> yeah, well, let's see. Um, I started, I won the job in October of 2018. So I guess oh. this would be my third season. <laughs> Coming you with, had yeah. one full season under your belt and then... <laughs> the 2019-2020. So um, Josh and Mary Kay, you know, both not quite totally, you know, being new members at the same time. There was a little bit of that space in there, but, you know, it must have been really interesting to have that kind of turnover in your positions and constantly, you know, shifting or, you know, how, so how did that feel, um, both of you coming in did it feel very settled or was it kind of like a new opportunity to make something new? Who's going with this one? <laughs> I, I can, I'll start. I was 20 years old, so I had no idea what I was walking into. I had never had a job before. I, so yeah, it felt totally new to me. Um, I had the only orchestral experience, the playing experience that I had was from Youth Symphony in high school and Curtis, um, which is a great orchestra, but it's a school, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I did feel like I was walking into, I, I, I didn't, I think maybe even at the time that I started, I had no idea that Mary Kay had just started as well. So I felt like, I mean, I knew she was new-ish, but I didn't know how new or that didn't, you know, like register for me. I, I have to say, like, not a lot registered. <laughs> I, I was walking into this situation, and I did feel like I was walking into a very established, like, very settled section. And and I the the for me, like, I think I was kind of blown away by how, in a certain way, um, simple it felt, and um, you know, straightforward it felt to to do the job because everyone around me was so uh, like playing on such a high level and so experienced and so, you know, settled in what they were doing that I just had to like make sure that I could plug into it. And so it was easier than I expected it would be. Hmm. Uh, yeah. I felt the first time uh, I... oh. Oh, oh, no, go ahead. You're fine. <laughs> okay. So, um, well, you were asking us about, you know, the same question more or less. So, uh, 
I would agree that um, our situation was a little different because I was 29 and I had come from a job and um, had been subbing in New York Phil. So I was kind of, you know, I, I probably was, it was still overwhelming but it was this great feeling of uh, such a high level of playing. And, you know, I would say to myself, if, if there, if something's out of tune, it's me, you know, <laughs> yeah. that was kind of a, that made it easier than, than the fish wondering, you know? Um, so, and I was um, very lucky that um, both John Rautenberg and Martha Aaron's really took me under their wing and they were, they helped a lot. Um, sometimes John would have a little fun by giving me cues to come in at the wrong place, but mostly, <laughs> mostly he was very helpful, you know? So, yeah. But yeah, it's scary at the beginning, but it was really exciting too. Yeah. So did you, you know, pass that pranks, you know, prank forward when Saren and Jess joined and keeping them uh, on their toes, little initiation? You know, John had a whole litany of jokes and, um, you know, before Jess, there was Maricela. And so interestingly, those two came in around the same time, just a year apart. So it was like the same kind of thing wow. years. And I was experiencing it from the other end being the old lady of the section with these two youngsters, so to speak. And um, it was very interesting and uh, and they're great. But I do remember trying to do like a lot of John's humor and mostly them not really getting it or, you know. <laughs> trying to avoid getting sucked into it, I think. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think they just thought I was really weird. Some of them stuck, like if Maricela was sitting to my right, I would say hello to her through the end of my flute, you know, and um, there were there were a few jokes that stuck around, but I, I realized that his very quirky humor um, was it? I don't know. It just was the wrong fit. <laughs> Sometimes though, I'll find things written in my music. I mean, and I'll ask you to explain it to me. Or drawings that Martha left in the back of a symphony with the conductor, like sweating everywhere. So, yeah, I mean, it's really fun <laughs> looking at these parts. <sighs> it's a little treasure trove. I love it. <laughs> So Sarah, and I know that you um, were a student of Josh's, um, you know, back before, you know, when you were in school and then went out into the freelance world and then won your job. How is that, you know, that, that developing that relationship and changing it in a way? Um, I mean, I love Josh. He was the perfect <laughs> teacher for me. Um, he knew exactly how to um, help me find the right character the right sound we just we connected immediately like I feel like as a student and teacher and being in the orchestra with him has just been amazing I mean I learned even more just from sitting next to him than I ever did in school and he's probably the single greatest influence on my playing um and sitting between Josh and Mary Kay was the most incredible experience of my entire life when you know when I first joined I just could not believe how incredible they sounded together and how easy it was to sit there. It felt, it felt like, I don't know, like probably getting into a fancy sports car for the first time. I was like, I can't believe that I get to sit between these two incredible <laughs> players. I, there are some parts where it would go from flute to piccolo and I sat right between them and I couldn't believe how good it sounded and how perfect and how the, the tone matched. And just, it was, it's a master class in orchestral playing to sit between them. Wow, that must have been amazing, yeah. I still feel that way. Oh. <laughs> um, so Jess, you know, we mentioned you're the newest member of the section. This would be your third season starting. Um, and you'd previously been in uh, positions in Oregon and Rochester, which are, you know, of course, great orchestras, but, you know, stepping into the revered, the Cleveland Orchestra, um, how, what did that feel like? I, I, I should, first of all, I should say, you know, the first two jobs that I had, I am so thankful for, like you said, they are also great orchestras. Um, and I feel very lucky that I was able to play different, um, positions within those orchestras. And had I not had the opportunity to have a piccolo job, um, as well as, uh, some experience with principal flute, I wouldn't maybe have had the opportunity to 
um, win this job as an assistant principal where I'm covering um, all of the roles sometimes. Not at the same time. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I mean, I guess to be honest, the um, making it to the final round of this audition was a very euphoric experience for me. And I've never felt that way at an audition. Normally it's it's really stressful and, you know, I, yeah. Um, but, you know, when the curtain came down and I see all these people that I absolutely love and admire and I've watched, I'm from Cleveland, I've watched all of them, studied with some of them um, um, since I was a kid. So sharing music with them alone on the Severance Hall stage in a final round, depending on whether I would get the job or not, was like, I like I teared up a little <laughs> oh yeah yeah. Yeah. Wow. But, yeah I mean this it, it it was I was also this huge sense of relief to um to win this position because you know prior to that I was taking a lot of other auditions and sometimes getting all the way to the very end and sometimes you know the next one I take I got cut after the first round and I put my heart and soul into every audition that I took and, and you know, my hard work and sweat. So yeah, <laughs> it was a really, really bumpy road. And man, what a relief to win a job with people that I love and I've watched since I was a kid and to be home. <laughs> I'm home and I love this section so much, all three of you. Same as what Sharon was saying, I'm sitting in between Josh and Mary Kay, or, you know, sitting, I guess, Sarah, you're on the other end <laughs> of me, but it's, it's an experience like I've never had before. So I'm in heaven. I, I would love, that's such, it's such a heartwarming, you know, audition experience. And yeah, yeah as we all know, some <laughs> of them can just feel like disaster. So that kind of, you know, no matter what the outcome, I'm sure it would have, you know, still been a really beautiful memory, but this just makes it even better. So, yeah, I'd love to kind of um, maybe go off on a little audition tangent, if you don't all don't mind. And, you know, between the four of you with, I think I add, added up the math uh, correctly, with about 75 years of collective orchestra experience just within Cleveland, you know, not your previous times, um, which is pretty incredible. I'm sure you've all, you know, sat on some very interesting audition panels or taken, you know, very educational auditions. Um, you know, what kind of advice do you have for, you know, maybe the flutists or non-flutists in our audience that are still holding out for that audition job or orchestral job rather? I could totally go, but well, I <laughs> You're the most recent, you should go for Okay, <laughs> this is how I, I I've been I I mean I'm I know you guys were on audition panels in the past too, um, but um, from being on both ends recently, um, I think um, what's been most important is I, I guess I started to think of myself as a saleswoman. <laughs> I'm selling my product to the best ability that you know in the best way that I can. So even if something there was a treacherous excerpt that absolutely freaked me out. Um, I think if the committee hears someone who can sell it in a way that it's played with confidence and um, it, clarity and, and uh, you know, this person knows what they're doing, even if it's maybe several notches slower, if it's a super technical passage, I think in my opinion, that's maybe more impressive to hear behind a curtain if the full package is consistent in that way. Um, but, you know, I, um, yeah, I don't know, you guys can elaborate more, I'm sure. <laughs> but I, yeah, it's always that, awesome. that but, makes a lot of sense, though. Yeah, it's you have to convince, you know, the panel that you're a good fit. But yeah, Josh, you were kind of uh, going to jump in. I think that that it I mean, yeah, that it's a it's a perfect way of saying it. It's what we're doing is communicating. And and um, I think that people try so hard to like go into and, and understandably so the, that that all of the energy gets spent in trying to be perfect or I mean, trying not to make a mistake, trying to make sure that you make everyone happy and therefore not enough energy gets spent um, believing in what you're doing and you know like finding your your voice finding a point of view and speaking with it or I should go you know finding your voice and speaking with it 
and and I think the people who there are very few people who can do that in the moment, and those are the ones who stand out in an audition. Yeah, those are great sentiments, Sarah and Mary Kay. Anything you want to add? I I would agree. If somebody, um, the people listening, don't want to be aware of your stress or struggle, so the ones that can not only play well, but play with ease and joy, mm. um, as hard as that is in, the, in that circumstance, um, they will be the ones that stand out. Yeah, I actually remember from my audition, um, we could choose our own solo piece. And I, I was hearing a bunch of like Ebear and all kinds of fast stuff. And I picked Syrinx and it, before I went out, I was like, oh my God, I've made a horrible mistake. I should have picked something flashy, but that piece just it meant something to me. And I felt like I could, you know, I felt like it showed a lot. I mean, it wasn't fast fingers, but there are other things that show that. So I think, um, you know, to keep that in mind when you're choosing, uh, your solo repertoire, it doesn't have to be just, you know, crazy fast technical stuff. There, sometimes when you play something lyrical, um, that can show as much or more actually about who you are and what you have to offer. Hmm. I love that, yeah, and and it's, that's your your mode of, of showcasing you. And, um, you know, I'm sure there were plenty of excerpts on that list for pyrotechnics and, you know, to really get into that technical side. So that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. Um, so if we did get a question and it was one I was uh, looking forward to asking anyway, you all play Powell flutes or instruments, piccolos in some format. Um, could you tell us all what you play? Uh, I'll start. I am fluctuating right now. I've I've played on a Powell since I was 15 years old, wow. and um, Jess Jessica has that very flute at the moment. Mm -hmm. She's borrowed it. Um, I that's a silver Powell, um, and I in probably like 15 years ago, maybe 20 even now, um, bought a, an old gold Powell, um, and. Uh, that I use that for a while. Currently, I'm on a wood, uh, the Grenadilla, all wood, and I fluctuate between that and the Powell, uh, the sorry, <laughs> the gold. So it's either all wood or it's gold with a wooden head joint. Those are my two, um, the two things I'm using most often right now. Gotcha. And you know, we'll we'll definitely come back and talk about that difference between your metal flutes and your wood flutes. But um, anybody want to want to jump in next? I also play on the Powell, uh, the, the wooden, all wood with the gold keys. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. One of my favorite flutes. <laughs> Great flute. I love it. Yeah. Um, and I, I have several Powell flutes. I also got my first Powell in high school, the end of high school. And um, Jess actually owns that Powell now. That's the <laughs> Powell I, I got my first job. And <laughs> Big competition so then she bought that flute many years ago um anyway when i switched from that flute i went to an older flute that i bought from the second flutist in the chicago symphony and i remembered his johnson. name ralph johnson yes <laughs> um, and i've had a love affair with old instruments ever since um actually i think it started with um old piccolos before it went to old flutes um, but I do also, I joined the club. I have a new wooden, uh, Powell. So it is fun when we all play on them together. Um, and I also have an Emmanuel. So I have kind of a collection. Um, but most often I'm playing a Powell. Sometimes I have an EV Powell, gold EV Powell head joint on my, one of my old Powells. But, um, that's been kind of fun during this COVID as far as getting me to practice. I have all these instruments. I have lots of, you know, piccolos and I, I have too many instruments, but I, you know, I can say I'm a collector. So it's been fun and keeps me playing because I like to compare them and try different things. And um, recently I had a little performance for a Hispanic festival and played a Piazzolla etude and um, 
I chose that that old Powell that used to belong to Ralph Johnson, that 1825 Powell, and and uh, and it worked great. And and that's what I've been playing on the most lately, which I played on for years and then kind of went away. And now I seem to be back. So yeah. anyway. Yeah, you, um, Mary Kay, you know, you were kind enough to send me your list of serial numbers, which is always just good, you know, for any of our audience out there um, to register your instrument with Powell. Heaven forbid anything happened to it. We can kind of help and assist you with that. But, you know, we like to keep track of where, you know, instruments uh, shift to with their owners. And yeah, you have an amazing collection with a lot of history. Your um, 822 Piccolo was owned by the wonderful Lois Schaefer, former Piccoloist. Yeah, that's uh, my best Piccolo of all, I would say. Uh, but interestingly yeah. enough, you know, I was so excited to learn that she was the owner. But I met her once and I, and I said, oh, I play on your old Piccolo 822. And she had no recollection of that. Piccolo. <laughs> so she was probably like me where she would, you know, buy them and then maybe try them for a while and sell them to a student or whatever. But she yeah. had no recollection of it. It obviously wasn't one of her favorites, but it's a great She had Piccolo. many, very many. <laughs> okay. so, so I guess I'm like her. <laughs> Uh, and then yeah your flutes too you know uh, previously owned by Ralph Johnson from the Chicago Symphony and then um Paul, Paul Rizzi. Rizzi. yeah yeah that, that's Sanders. also a really great flute that's the one I use with the EV um Powell head on often yeah wow. yeah it's fun oh beautiful and then Jess so you play on Mary Kay's old flute which correct me if I'm wrong you won your job on yeah I mean I, now I have a I have a plethora of Powells and I feel like I should None of them came directly from me. I purchased them from different people. So maybe I need to get my very own and then sell them. No. I think so. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that's going to happen at some point. Um, yeah, so I purchased, uh, it's uh, 5675, I think, uh, right? Yeah, I purchased that from, right? Um, I purchased that from you when I was in high school. Um, and if, I was not used to old pals. I, I had started on, I think, um, a Miramatsu and, um, it, it was, it was definitely a different experience moving from that to an older, older Powell. Um, the, uh, yeah. And I, I took that through college. I, I won my job. I won all my jobs on this magical Powell. And I think Mary Kay, you told me you won Cleveland on it too. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. I brought that yeah. Yeah, it's it's a magic Powell. I got and I think it isn't actually Powell or something, right? Uh, what the foot joint? The foot joint isn't yeah, doesn't Miramatsu. It it originally had a C foot joint, and I I bought another. And then you changed the head joint, so it was a total mutt. Yeah, it's just it's different. different. <laughs> Which is really cool. but yeah, so now actually I'm experimenting. I um, I purchased a, an original Lafan head joint, um, and I'm. Um, really enjoying it on Josh's Powell. Um, uh, I don't remember what, what serial. Yours is in the 6,000s, I think, right? 6323. Six, yeah, and it's it's a really, it's, it's again, all of these different serial numbers, I, th these instruments offer either like a heavier wall or um, easier low notes, or I, it's, it's really fun to experiment. So yeah, and, and also I think I bought a Powell Piccolo for Mary Kay. <laughs> That you found for me as well. <laughs> um, I can't quite remember what the serial number is, but that got me my job in, in Rochester. So maybe I just have to buy instruments from you guys <laughs> every year or something <laughs> for good luck. Um, yeah. Uh, you clearly have very good taste and really, you know, know how to pick them. So I see. <laughs> so would you mind, especially um, Saren and Josh and, and Mary Kay, um, talking about, you know, the differences between wood and metal and what that's like. And um, Sarah, and, you know, kind of on a side note, did you win your job on a wood flute or did you switch once you, you know, stepped into the orchestra? Uh, well, no, I didn't have a wood flute when I won my job. But now that you ask that, I can't remember what I was playing on when I won my job. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was, I think it was an Oramite Powell, wasn't it? An Oramite head joint. I do remember that. Yeah, it must have been a Powell. I'm sure it was. <laughs> it was a long time ago. And I, I kept messing around with head joints for a while. So I had a, a Hal Roberts wood head joint 
for a while that I played on. And then I got, oh, I think I had some Nagahara woodhead joints. And then at some point I just, I tried the, the wood pell and it was just better than mm. anything else. And, and I bought that, but now I switch between that and I have a Brannon white gold flute with a Lafan head joint, which is 22 karat gold <laughs> head joint. So it's, you know, the one flute weighs like nothing and the other thing is like this dense brick. And so when I switch between them, the, the wood flute always feels like it's about to fly out of my hand. It was so much lighter. I mean, I, I think that at the end of the day, for me, as a person who I sit next to somebody who switches all the time, I switch all the time. I don't know if I could pinpoint a lot of differences between them in terms of sound. I, I'm sure there's some, there's th some things about it. But I feel like most people think there's a bigger difference because they're listening with their eyes. So mm -hmm. I feel like I get that a lot from other people who, who will think that um, they can tell the difference. And I'm like, wow, you're amazing because I'm a flute player and I do this all the time. And I, if it were behind a screen, I don't know if I could tell the difference. Yeah. It just depends on, um, on the instrument. I mean, if it's a modern instrument, like our, Josh and I have a modern wooden Powell, it sounds like a modern instrument. I mean, it's, I don't know, Josh, what do you think? Well, I do also agree that it's for me hard to articulate exactly. Like, I don't, I don't think that that the I can't list a whole bunch of differences and and say you know prove that this is this is a, you know like if I heard someone playing wood, I might I might recognize it, but I could be wrong too. And um and ultimately, I play wood because I enjoy how it, I feel connected to it. I mean, mm -hmm. I I think that I spent a lot of time. I've always appreciated the, you know, having a, a, at least a, a, a read on historical approach. And I never had access to a good, uh, or I just, actually, I should say that I've never really at all been interested in equipment. I, I, I'm the kind of person who will stick with the flute because it's my flute and not try to experiment because it drives me crazy. Like when I first started playing a gold flute and also had a silver flute, I would, I, I made myself insane trying to decide exactly why I would choose the silver for this, this repertoire and why I would choose the gold for this repertoire and, and what was different about why, blah, 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 you know, like it would just go on and on and I would, I would feel like it was impossible to make a decision. So I, I, would, I would just decide, look, I'm doing this for a while and it's just gonna be the flute for a while. And I'm a little looser on that now because I think it's interesting to have options. But um, I, I think that through all of this, I was, I was always focusing on not sounding um, like a lot, like hugely bright. I was always trying to sound, I, I think that's why I've always um, appreciated Powell because I, I feel like the, the Powell um, aesthetic is dark and mellow and, um, you know, not like hugely metallic. And, and a silver flute is a, me is a metal flute. And a gold flute is a little more mellow than that, and a, and wood just doesn't feel like metal. Um, whether you can tell the difference or not, I'm not always sure. But for me, it feels um, it just feels better to play, and it feels easier to negotiate blending with other people on wood. Mm. Even when those people are playing wood, or it um, doesn't really matter. Just regardless, it's easier. I think so. I mean, I actually I think especially well. So you're asking, do, do we, would I insist that someone playing with me and another flutist should play wood if I'm playing wood? Not at all. Like, I, I think, you know, just make it work. You know, it doesn't really matter what you're using. Um, and, but, but I've, I've just really settled into enjoying how the wood feels. And when I go back to met, like all metal, I just don't enjoy it that much anymore. That's, thank you for your, your thoughtful answers. And, you know, I think, um, Saren, you're exactly right. You know, people see a wood flute and they expect this is going to be totally different. And yeah, they're, they're built to be modern, to project as loud as you need, to be in tune as any other flute. And yeah, we, you know, hear with our eyes, like you there's said. Nothing, there's nothing in the repertoire that I can't play on my wood flute. Right. 
Same here. And, and I really, that's actually because I'm that person who, who wants not to have to be messing around with deciding what equipment to use all the time. When I found the wood flute and I realized that I could do whatever I wanted on it, I, I, I was just completely thrilled because it had, because I spent a lot of time trying to find my way into making my silver flute sound a little more like wood. Uh, you know, a little less modern, a little less bright. I, when I, when I found the wood and could, you know, could sound silver enough with it, then, then it just felt like the right decision. That's I, wow. um, I, I have some to add um, from a piccolo perspective. Um, I think the difference is even more noticeable on a piccolo if you play a wood piccolo versus a silver piccolo. And I got my first job on a silver piccolo. Um, one of those old cylindrical Hanes where the high notes just pop out. I really wasn't a piccolo player yet, but those are so easy to play. So, um, but the way I would describe it is um, I would say the wood sound is a little bit fatter and maybe not so edgy. Um, the, the silver is maybe more burnished and spinny. Um, and that's my feeling on the flute too. It's more obvious on a piccolo, but I would say, you know, still 90% is the person and then 5% maybe or more than that might be a head joint cut and then the material. Um, but material does definitely have does there there's something about certain materials create different overtones so there is a subtle a subtle tone color difference on the material and i think it's kind of a personal preference that's really helpful i think um so we do have a question from our audience on related to this um pam is asking is the wood a lot heavier and would someone make a decision because of the weight i don't think so <laughs> what is the wood heavier then I think it depends on what you're comparing it to I mean yeah my yep. gold flute weighs a ton it's the heaviest flute I have ever held I remember Maricela <laughs> Maricela loved um her sil light walled light silver flute and you know my my flute just weighs a ton mm -hmm. so compared to that the wood flute is light but compared mm -hmm. to her flute it was heavier I think you know it's all about comparisons there's it's you know it depends Right. Absolutely. Yeah, the wood the wood feels heavier than my eighteen twenty five Powell, for example. So, yeah, it all depends on the model, the material. Absolutely, it's also a little different in the hand position too, and I I have a little trouble with that actually. Just on a your little wood flute. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know it's it's funny you mentioned that we, you know, some if you have often if they have larger hands, you know, it feels a little more ergonomic because that tube is so much thicker or the opposite where it's my hand really has to stretch for it. Or it just may be different than I'm used to or something, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Pam. And um, just some quick hellos. We have viewers in New Mexico and Maryland. Hello, Melinda and Andrew, Luke from Long Island. So thank you everybody for tuning in to our webcast with the Cleveland Orchestra flute section. And of course, as you've heard, we're happy to answer questions and bring them to this great group of flutists. Um, so I, you know, as now we are going through COVID and you know, missing these live performances, whether it's playing or attending. Um, I imagine that, you know, especially you all have, you know, pretty great careers so far, you know, pretty long careers. Um, how do you keep all the repertoire fresh? You know, maybe something like a Beethoven five or, um, you know, something that is just played every year. Um, how do you uh, overcome that challenge? I always want to not be the first person to dive in. So <laughs> anyway, I'll just say this really quickly before you dive in. I have no answer to that because I feel like everything is still very new. <laughs> I'm actually playing with these guys. So yeah. You can certainly jump off of that after this then. <laughs> answer to that, Josh might though. <laughs> I guess I don't, I, I, I think I'm good at that because I don't, I don't feel it. I don't think about it as, as, oh, another Beethoven five. I mean, some of that can be um, 
dependent upon the, the context, the situation, the conductor. I mean, I certainly have had more, um, I've certainly had performances of Beethoven Five that I've enjoyed more than others and less than others, but, um, but I, I think I, from the very beginning, made a, a really solid choice to, to, to play as if, to, no matter what I was playing, to play as if I, it was the first time I was doing it. And, um, and, and let's face it, like every situation really is different. I mean, that's one of the greatest things about performing and about music is, is that it's not always the same. It's never the same actually. So um, if you can uh, remember the aspects that sort of set it apart and um, make it interesting, I'm, I'm just trying to do my best all the time. And that's challenging all the time. And so, so the job feels new most of the time, I think. Have you guys ever noticed too, I, when you, I mean, there are some pieces that I, I've, you know, performed like more than four times or something, but <laughs> have you noticed that depending on who the conductor is, if, if maybe there's a section they want softer, that things are brought out that you never heard before in that symphony, which makes it like sometimes this will become my favorite section, not knowing previously that all oh, the basses had this really cool, you know, pizzicato or something that I, I really couldn't hear maybe in a different hall or with a different orchestra or with a different conductor. But I, I guess if, if it were for me, you know, playing a piece many times, that could be something to keep it exciting too, if you could listen for things. Not to talk too much, but absolutely. I think that, that that's actually one of, the, again, one of the things that I like so much about my job. And um, it, it, it's, it's just another way of saying that it's different every time. Um, and, and, and therefore it's interesting most of the time. Yeah. yeah, I think the challenge is not so much Beethoven V as um, Silent Night or something, you know, when we do all these Christmas shows and some of the tunes we play many times every year. So th that would be more of a challenge. And then sometimes if I'm starting to feel that way, I think about a friend of mine who's been playing in a, the same Broadway show for over 30 years. So, <laughs> so very fortunate. Yes, <laughs> no, that's, a, that's a good way to bring the perspective back. Uh -huh. I would have been playing in the Hamilton pit <laughs> the rest of my life though. <laughs> Oh, for maybe maybe a week you would. <laughs> <laughs> maybe two. <laughs> okay. <I'm still> <laughs> Although you know, I'm sure that's not without its challenges with understudies and you know so many shows a week. That's its yeah. you know, it has its own own challenges there. Absolutely, absolutely. Sarah, anything to add or uh, good on this one? It's all been said. I feel like it's been covered. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, maybe we maybe just have a few minutes left. And um, to our audience, um, thank you, Michael Lynn. He's from Ohio. He says, nice to see and hear from the hometown. Hi, Michael. Hi. <laughs> the hometown team and uh, Shanna from North Carolina. Um, you know, so with just a few minutes left, um, if, you know, there's anything you want to add as far as, you know, it's so rare that we have like a full orchestral section like this, you know, how, you know, it is blending, you know, we've talked about our different instruments, but if you feel like you have anything to add in terms of um, fitting together and jumping in, in terms of your experiences and, uh, um, you know, the different repertoire, we'd, uh, I'm sure the audience is always uh, happy to hear a little more. I want to say that one of the things that I am often asked about uh, and I'm sure Siren gets this too from the other direction, is um, like what the role of the second flute player is. And what I'm asked usually, especially if I'm sitting next, well, I mean, this this comes up anytime I'm teaching and uh, I'm we're playing together. The, 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 the question goes something like, do you want me to take a, you know, do you want me to be a, a subordinate? Should I, should I, should I like shadow you? And I, my answer is always, God, no, you know, like, please play. I, I want you, I need the support and I want to feel like we're equally engaged. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to feel like we're competing, but, but absolutely like you're, you're an equal voice. And, um, and that's, I think if both people have the same intention, that's what makes blending work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
sorry, there's a bug. <laughs> so I pull over, I'm like, ah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've talked to students about that before too. Usually when I'm working with a, a kids in an orchestra, like doing sectionals, I'm begging the second flutist to play more. I'm not really sure what that's about. They think they're supposed to hide or, you know, there is an art to knowing when to come out of the texture and when to go back, you know, and, and you know, for instance, when Josh and I are in octaves, I try to play more than him. So he has something to play down into. I mean, you know, it's just from years of doing it, you learn, oh, you know what, when I, when we do this, I need to be more and then I need to back off here. Um, but generally just, it's better to be told to play less <laughs> than to be begged to play more. So Absolutely. I go for it, you know, like you can always turn it down a notch, but you know, don't be afraid to, to play. And, and the second player is not, you know, the second player, they're the principal of the second, of the second line of the inner, in a, the inner voice. And that's important. And um, you need to know um, when to, to support the upper voice. I mean, really what's useful, and I don't know if, if, if you guys also find this, but switching around, which we've done every once in a while, is really illuminating to play principal when I've been playing the second part all the time and you, you hear it differently or play piccolo or you know when we are able to shift around and play a different part of a piece, you've been playing the same part on for years. It's really helpful. It's really informative. So I encourage all students to try and play as many different roles as possible because that's how you learn. I think we're also focused on trying to play a principal part, but you know, you, you're you gonna be better at whatever job you're doing if you understand how everything fits together. Mm, that's really I feel like second flute is the hardest job <laughs> out of everyone. I think <laughs> And pickle is really hard. That was principal. I mean, principal, whatever, but. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, there's no hiding when you're playing pickle, that's for sure. Yeah. Mary Kay, anything to add? Or Jess, you know, as you both kind of um, jump between, Jess, you know, between absolutely more, more than most, probably the different parts and having to sit in different chairs and you know, Mary Kay, maybe between swapping your instruments and, you know, going from the loudest <laughs> voice in the orchestra. Right, going from a low register third flute part to some high piccolo part. Uh, it gets, all I can say about that is it just gets easier over time. Yeah, it keeps it interesting, that's for sure. That's true, never boring. <laughs> <laughs> Especially those quick changes where you think you might drop one of them. You know? <laughs> Uh, well, thank you all so much for, for joining me today and for sharing your wisdom and your experiences, your insight. Um, I, you know, certainly learned a lot. And so hopefully our audience did too. And um, just, of course, next month, our next Powell Flutes webcast Q&A will be October 22nd, 2 p.m. as always, uh, with Sylvia Caridou. Um, and Powell's general manager, Daniel Sharp, will be chatting with her about, you know, the European flute school and how it compares to, you know, American flute playing and, and education and all that. So it should be a good one. But Josh, Jess, Sarah, Mary Kay, thank you all so much. The Cleveland Orchestra Flute Section. It was an absolute pleasure having you today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Take care. Thanks.